Okay, so chapter six was all about approximating the posterior mm -hmm. and our learning objectives were to... Do you have something to present or something like that? No? Uh, no. <laughs> okay, no, that's fine. Let's go through the... Um, but if you if you like, what we can do is we can go through the... If you can just project, or I can share my screen, but I think it's easier if you do it um, with a book so that we can have something oh. to look at. Is my screen not sharing? No. Oh. <laughs> do, do I have to authorize you? No. No. It's... Or it could be that you are and I, I'm just not seeing it. Let me see. Because sometimes yeah. Zoom is crazy. Ah, yeah, I see you. Oh, oh I'm so sorry. It's That's my okay. fault. <laughs> I When I have two monitors, I'm so stupid. I'm sorry. When I have two monitors, my Zoom just goes crazy. And then I'm like, what am I doing? Anyway. Yeah, that's why I was having trouble because of multiple monitors. Like I want <laughs> it to be on this screen, but then. Yeah, so I see you here, <laughs> but I have the book here. Oh, it's crazy. Anyway, <laughs> go ahead, Diane. I'm so sorry. That's okay. Uh, the learning objectives were yeah. to... Uh, look at two different ways of approximating the posterior. So first using grid approximation to simulate uh, the posterior distribution, um, but as they go into, there's some limitations with that and how to address those limitations by using uh, one Markov chain Monte Carlo posterior simulation uh, using R and then learning how to diagnose, diagnose your Markov chains to examine the quality of your MC, MC posterior simulation. Okay, so the whole point of all this is because we're trying to calculate the posterior distribution seen here through Bayes' rule. They missed the meetings where we talked about the conjugate priors. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah. <laughs> and um, so for Bayes' rule, calculating the numerator isn't a big issue because we tell it the likelihood um, distribution and the prior distribution. So that's easy for the algorithm to do. Uh, but things get complicated when we get to the denominator because it's difficult to calculate that. So one solution is to use simulations to approximate the posterior distribution. And the first method of doing that is through grid approximation, uh, which is a discretized approximation of the posterior. So this is a method of producing samples, and the first step is to define a grid of possible values of the parameters theta, and then you uh, calculate the numerator at each of those possible values, and then you obtain a discrete approximation of the likelihood by, that's the likelihood, right, <laughs> by normalizing the results. And you do that by dividing by the sum. And then you randomly sample the grid values using the probabilities from step three. And all of these, this seemed pretty vague until you go through the code. And then it's like, oh, that makes more sense. So they went through an example using the beta binomial uh, distributions. And so here we see we are uh, assigning a binomial distribution to our likelihood and a beta distribution to our prior pi. And um, I forget what example they use for this, but if you have nine successes, then you can plug that into your likelihood. Yeah, so for step one, we're defining our grid. So from here, we're setting 
are uh, pi values from zero to one, and we're using a hundred lengths of that. And uh, so in the book, the they first showed us this whole process, but using just six values. Um, mm -hmm. But when we use six values, we found that the approximated posterior did not fit well with the samples we then pulled from that posterior. So that was not a good model. <laughs> so this is from the second example where they increased the number of values to 100. You shall see it is much better. Uh, so once you have your uh, values assigned, then you calculate uh, your prior values using the beta distribution and then your likelihood values using the binomial distribution. And then you calculate the unnormalized uh, numerator, which is just the multiplication of the prior and the likelihood. And then finally, to get your posterior estimate, you divide the each unnormalized value by the sum of all the unnormalized values. And that gets you your approximated posterior. And then uh, you're going to sample a bunch of values from this posterior. So in this case, we're extracting 10,000 samples. And we told it we're getting them from the posterior values. So we do that. And the histogram shows you the samples that we pulled from that. So from here, you can see that the samples are pretty similar or really similar to our estimated posterior distribution. Okay. And then they go through an example using the Poisson gamma distributions uh, that people can check out on their own time. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, grid approximation has some limitations, mainly that it's, it doesn't allow larger calculations. So with more complicated models where you have multiple parameters, uh, you're quickly going to run into computational issues. So in those cases, a good alternative is Markov chain Monte Carlo uh, simulations to help you approximate the posterior. And I was kind of, I guess, annoyed hearing how they came up with this name because I never looked into it. And I thought like, oh, it's probably something fancy but it was just like the Markov chain is the fancy thing. And then they just got this Monte Carlo from a casino or something. Like what? <laughs> 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 yeah, so um, these types of simulations produce uh, at least one Markov chain to approximate the posterior, uh, but you should use multiple Markov chains to get a better estimate of the posterior. And these samples are not directly from the posterior and they are not independent. And they're not independent because as the uh, simulator is pulling values, the second value sort of depends on the previous value and then the next value depends on that second value and so on. Uh, and there will be more on that in the next chapter. Mm -hmm. But then we went into our beta binomial example for MCMC simulation using SAN, which was kind of a learning curve because I'm a JAGS person. <laughs> I'm a JAGS person too. <laughs> I'm trying to jump into Nimble now so that I can just use Nimble as much as possible. So I'm, I really don't know anything about Stan, yeah. Yeah, I've heard of Nimble, but not enough to know what it is. No. 
yeah, I'm, I'm a Jax person too. So, but let, yeah, it's, I think the idea is going to be the same either way. Yeah. My brain just doesn't want to, like, commit to Stan because I'm like, I already learned Jax. What? I can't yeah. a complicated thing right now. <laughs> I know, it's just so much, right? <laughs> Okay, so to define the model in the stand language, you have to give it your data, your parameters, and your model. And then you really have to hold stand's hand and tell it uh, what your values are. Oh yeah, your y values. And you tell it your y values are between zero and 10 and they're mm -hmm. an integer. Your parameters are gonna be teen are going to be between zero and one and they're real numbers. Yeah, and you're, you're you're just using one parameter, right? Pi. Yes, in this case. Mm. Which is good because if there was more complication, I would be extra confused. <laughs> mm. And here uh, we set our response variable as coming from a binomial distribution and our prior pi is coming from a beta distribution. And then you use the stand command to simulate the posterior and that goes into a stand object called bb. Wait, wait, wait. so let's just see this. So you're gonna put the bb model, which is what you just defined, the data, you give it the data that we, um, oh, yeah. that we want. We're using four chains. So we want four MCMC, well, four MCMCs. Yeah, so four yes. Markov chains. We want it to be 100,000 iterations. And that's the seed number which is gonna start. But yeah, now explain the following. Yeah, exactly. Uses four chains, yeah. Yeah, I guess I was kind of confused why they specified the iterations this way like 5,000 by two rather than just 10,000. Oh, it's 5,000. It's 5, I thought it was 50,000. Oh, forgive me. Okay, so it's so it's just, it's 10,000 in total. I think this has to do with, um, yeah, so we need to check this out and maybe I can open Stan and try to understand this. So those 10,000 iterations, so those 10,000 samples are not, exactly what you're going to end up producing because of what they because how many you're not using 10,000 per for for each one of the chains there's the burning there's the thinning and there are other things that we need to take into account here so so yeah let's go through that so half of them are discarded in the burning yeah So let's see. So, but you can specify what how much you want the burning to to be. I don't know why they didn't put it here, but um, yeah. but you can do that. Maybe just for simplicity. Oh yeah, yeah let's see. see. Oh, I guess it says by default it does. It throws half of them out for burning. Ah, so stand by default, but that's important because Jax doesn't do it like that. Yeah, Jax. You specify in Jax the burning. Um. <laughs> okay, so I'm just trying to see something here. Then uh, the final number. Let's see, let me see something so that we can continue later. Uh, 
I don't I don't know how many. No, I don't know with STEM, but anyway, the important thing here is that we have to know eventually how many samples we're gonna get per chain in the end. So for JAGS, I think it is the samples minus the burning divided by the thin, and then all of that divided by the number of chains. I think that's how JAGS does it. I don't know how Stan does it though. So that if you put a 10,000 there, that doesn't mean that you're gonna get 10,000 in the end. So here, maybe that's why they are doing it like that, the times two, so that they know that if half of that is gonna go into the burning, that means that 5,000 are the ones that you're gonna end up with. If they're not using any thinning, that that means their thinning is gonna be one. So that should be 5,000 divided by one. And then I don't know if they, if that is per chain or if you still have to divide that 5,000 by each one of the chains. I am not sure how Stan works, but we can see that in the, in the figure, I think, because they don't explain that. And I, I, the only reason why I'm mentioning it, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sort of hijacking your, your explanation is because, um, yeah, no, they, I don't, I don't remember they, ex, they explained this. Um, because then I have to learn this the hard way. The I mean, someone asked me and I'm like, no, I put in 10,000 simulations. So that's what I have. And they were like, no, that's not the final number. You need to take these things into account. So I ended up looking like an idiot. <laughs> oh, in this case, yeah, that 5,000 is going to be, I see it now in figure 6.8. Those 5,000 are going to be per chain. Okay, that's good. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good. So that's how Stan works. Um, but Jax does not work like that. No. Nope. <laughs> and I don't know how Nimble works, but that's something to keep in mind. Okay. Okay, so sorry, you can continue. <laughs> now, once you have your stand fit objects, you can extract the samples. Like here, we're pulling out our by parameter and assigning it to object chains, plotting that. Yeah, you only have the five, the the, the last five thousand the five, the last one hundred simulations there maybe, because the ones that they do have in the book, it's all the way up to five thousand, I think. Oh. Yeah, maybe they did this just to zoom in. Yeah, the, the those are probably the, the last 100. Yeah. Yeah, that's why they look so separated. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But here you see the samples exploring the parameter space. Exactly, and exactly. And you can tell they're auto-correlated because as values go down, the other values are going down. And when they go up, other values are going down, up. <laughs> so uh, do you do you understand what that autocorrelation means? I don't, I've never really understood that. So what happens if you have a chain that's going down and then another one that's going up? What does that mean? Non-zero autocorrelation. Yeah, my understanding of autocorrelation is it's kind of like a time series thing where uh -huh. you like start with one data point and then the next data point is associated with your previous data point. Uh -huh. And then your third one is associated with your second data point. Uh -huh and your fourth data point associated with your third and like so on. So that's what they mean by um, MC 
BMC samples not being independent. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so we I want them to be to be zero autocorrelation. That's what we want, right? That's the goal. If we have strong autocorrelation, then that means that they are dependent of one another, I suppose. I feel like they touched on that, but I don't remember what they said about it. That's why I just uh, I are, yeah the correlation plot yeah I guess you're right right like they are related to one another that's why the thinning is important but I've read that some authors say that thinning doesn't matter in the end but I always set my thinning mm -hmm. as ten or twenty because then you're not gonna get the one right after the other one so the thinning is gonna be like okay I'm gonna use this value but then drop the following 10 and then use the, 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 the one after that, and then drop the following 10 and then use the following one. So that's what the thinning does, right? Yeah. But um, so it, it, it helps with autocorrelation or to just to avoid having autocorrelated values. I guess that's, that's what, what it means, right? Um, yeah, I think they went over that in the diagnostic section. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah, but we can continue. I'm so sorry. I... That's okay. <laughs> We're not alone anymore. <laughs> mm, yeah, solo Wafemi, hello. No worries if you're late. No. So now we plot the resulting distribution of the samples mm -hmm. using this code. And the book they showed that the samples you pull out of it are pretty close to the posterior distribution. So mm -hmm. this is a good model. But in general, how do we know if a model is a good one? So there are these Markov chain diagnostics. And there are four primary tools for that, um, including trace plots, which are more visual, the effective sample size, which is a ratio, uh, autocorrelation, and R hat. So, mm -hmm. with trace plots, you want to look for good mixing and compare the parallel chains. So, here's a good example of what that looks like. I was always told that you should, that your chains should look like a fuzzy caterpillar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And it's going pretty straight. So that's a good sign that it's a good model. Um, but if you see like it's going diagonal or it's a fuzzy caterpillar and then it gets cut and then it's fuzzy again and then mm -hmm. cut, <laughs> then that's also a Bad. sign that something's off. You can also calculate the effective sample size, which looks at um, the correlation between samples. I've never used this in my life, <laughs> but it's good to know it exists. Yeah, the effective sample sizes, if you've used this package called MCMC this, mm -hmm. uh, VIS, you can, I think you can have, uh, not necessarily, just when you do the summary in JAGS, I use R JAGS. Um, 
the RJAX package. And then you can see it like right at the end of the summary of your result where you have like the mean of each one of your priors. The end is gonna be NF, just that. And that's the number of effective sample sizes. Which if I'm not mistaken, what it means is how many, after the thinning and all of that, how many of those samples that you use are actually not correlated or something like that and are helping inform um, the posterior, I think. And you put here that a good rule of thumb is to use 10% of the actual samples. So then as long as that number, that's what someone told me once, that as long as that number, the number of effective sample sizes is larger than a thousand, then you're good. So you want that NF uh, to be as high as possible. If you, sometimes you're gonna have, um, let's say you're estimating two parameters, you're gonna have one parameter. Let's say this was like a linear regression. So you will have like the beta zero and the beta one, right? So maybe the beta zero is gonna have a thousand uh, NF or sample size. And then the beta one is gonna be 200. That's your effective sample size. Then that, that means you didn't get convergence just for that one um, parameter. So you need to rerun things. <laughs> yeah. So that's, uh, yeah, I remember someone told me that more than a thousand, but <laughs> I like this, that best if more than 10% of the actual samples, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. That helps me out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then the ratio. Yeah. So I suppose the ratio is um from zero to one. Yeah. The larger, the better. Okay. Okay. And then autocorrelation. Yeah. Yep. Um... So always correlation measures the correlation between pairs of Markov chain values that are some number of steps apart. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So these ones look good. So we want autocorrelation to be um to be like, yeah, like like those, like those, like what you have there. Because sometimes you have like very high, well, I, I'm used to seeing them in bars. So you would have like a lot of oh, yeah. the bar, your bars would be all high instead of a, a rapid decrease. So that then that means that you have high autocorrelation. So you want the lag to drop as fast as possible and as soon as possible. Yeah. Yeah, basically. Because it signals good mixing, isn't it? I'm sorry. That makes sense. Yeah. It means that your chains are, are mixed well. Yeah. And you can see that uh, if I have this curve decline, so I like get zero lag, your uh, auto correlation is at one because that first value is completely correlated with itself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then by the second or by your first lag, um, there's a little bit less correlation because the first value and the second value are similar but not identical anymore. And then your like second value and your fifth value are going to be pretty different from each other. Uh, yeah. But if, yeah, the autocorrelation disappears. Yeah. Yeah, but if you were to get a curve like this, then that would be bad news because it's saying yeah. that your first value is still super correlated with your 20th value. So that's an indicator that your mixing is not going well. Exactly. So mixing. And then the 
r hat is the ratio of the variability between chains to the variability within chains. And you usually want your r hat to be around one. Mm -hmm. But if it's higher than 1.05, then you probably have problems in your model. So for this example one, we got an r hat of pretty close to one. That was a good model. Mm -hmm. The R hat is an indicator of convergence. Mm -hmm. Then the chapter goes into way more detail on all of these things. Yeah. Okay, so for the summary, we learned about thread approximation, which is pretty straightforward, but is limited once you get to more complicated models. And you can also use MCMC approximation, which is way more flexible and computationally powerful. Yes, I like it how you put it, computationally powerful. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We also learned how to evaluate our MCMC simulations. And the next chapter will be uh, delving more into how these MCMC simulations work under the hood. Yeah. It's scary. <laughs> no, I think, well, yeah, it is scary. I'm not going to lie. But it's good to know, right? I, uh, I just, I love. Um, Statistics. I'm not a quantitative ecologist, but I love learning about these things. And um, so I, I always get so excited. So forgive me if I was interrupting a lot. Okay. Something that I think we can discuss a little bit. I don't know if you if you if you want to, but um sometimes chains behave badly. So what do we do when that happens? So what are, because they always tell you, yeah, it has to look like a caterpillar and this is perfection yeah. and then move on. But then you're doing your model and then you're like, oh my God, I don't have a caterpillar. What do I do? You yeah. know? So we can maybe talk about that. So that would be like, um, yeah, when your chains don't behave the way you expect them to. So, because they, they don't, I don't know if they're going to get into that later on, but they sort of tell you these are the tests that you can do to see if your chains behaved well. They don't tell you what to do if they don't. I, I, at least I don't know if they did. I don't remember. I read this in the weekend. So when we have issues with convergence, right, when your chains didn't mix well, one thing that we can do is increase the burning Oh, yeah. period, the number of chains that we're going to burn, which are the first ones that are going to get discarded, right? That's the burning uh, part. So if we say, I want a thousand iterations and my burning is a hundred, that means use that burning hundred uh, um, samples to just sort of test the waters. I don't want to know the results with the burning. It's just so that the um, they, the, the chain, the MCMC algorithm can start to sort of get a feel of the of the parameter and, and the space that they are that that it's in, I suppose. So if we increase the burning period, it has more chance to sort of explore that um, that space a little bit more and to draw more samples right from the from the space that we're giving it. Another thing that we can do is use informative priors if it's something that we can do if not if you're using an uninformative prior like a uniform prior like the the one that we usually go with which is the uh, unif uniform distribution with zero one parameters right that's the the usual one that we see which we saw in previous chapters so if we um well it depends on what we are doing right but usually we go with that one um, so try to go with an informative prior if, if we can't, because I feel like that's a luxury. If we can't, then let's try other things. 
The other thing that we can do is also pick better initial values. So because um, the that's the other thing that we are sort of telling it to, I don't know in Stan where that is, but at least in JAX, you can pick the initial values. Um, the other thing is to, let me see what I have here. Standardized covariates. Oh, um, so, well, I assume I always work with um, my covariates are always standardized. Uh, yeah. But sometimes people say to use um, non centering reparametrization. So, in other words, I usually do that, right? Like when, when I have a, my covariates, I standardize them so that the mean is gonna be zero and the standard deviation is gonna be one. But some people say that if you're going with, to, if you're having convergence issues, you can try a different standardization process and use a non-centering one. Anyway, uh, obviously go through the model and see if everything was okay. And yeah, that's what I have. <laughs> uh, yeah, usually with changing the burning and increasing the sample size. So instead of having 10,000 iterations, you go for 50,000. Usually that does the trick. Yeah. If not, then yeah. You want to say something about that? Uh, yeah, they kind of touched on that. I don't think they talked about burn-in, but they did say, you know, putting more iterations. Yeah. I'm trying to see where they mentioned thinning. Yeah, I've never, yeah, I don't know what, I always do 10, thin equals 10. I've seen people not use thin, thinning, don't do any thinning, I usually do 10. Let me see if I can find it, control and thinning. Um, oh, here it is. What happens uh, when you discard draws in between? You remove strong correlations at low lags. So, ah, like here, yeah. And also here you have like pretty high correlation at zero and 20 time yeah. steps. Um, but then if you thin it, so you only keep every 10th value. Yeah. Then you can control for that a bit better. So here's an example. <laughs> yeah. So this one had strong correlations early on. It doesn't have that nice smooth shape. Mm -hmm. So they thinned out and kept every 10th value. And that helped a little bit. Yeah. But not too much. And they also mentioned that like there's some balance. Like, yeah, you can throw out a bunch of samples, but is it worth uh, what you get for your parameter estimate? The other thing that they are saying is that this depends. There was a warning, I think, right there. Right there, the warning. Yeah. No, uh, below, below, in the pink oh, box. Right. Yeah. So when it comes to thinning, and this is why I always think it's important to know, because right now there's bugs, Jags, Stan, and Nimble, right? At least those are the four software big software or big um, 
what do you call that? Yeah, software packages, whatever mm -hmm. that operate or that you can use to do Bayesian analysis, right? But each one has their own different quirks. So one of the things that they're saying here is that, for example, RSTEN and RSTEN ARM, STANARM, or whatever it's that called, those two packages that are based on STAN, they employ an efficient Hamiltonian Monte Carlo algorithm. And as such, in the current STAN help file, the package authors advise against thinning unless your simulation hooks up too much memory in your machine. But in JAGS, you are encouraged to do thinning. So that's the other thing that, that I always, ugh, I find it so annoying because then the books, like the theory tells you one thing, but then with, the, with each package, you're gonna find something different. So I, yeah. So I always focus on those things when I'm talking to people, just so that, um, if they're working on Stan, I'm working on Jags. We're we're talking different languages, basically. We have to, and even between Jags, because our Jags is one thing, and there's another one. Uh, I think when I looked into it, there's like four Jags packages. There's like right. Jags, Jags UE, Jags UE. No, you're right. I, that's I the one use. I use. <laughs> no, I use Jags UE, and you're right. Or oh, do I use Jags? Our Jags. Anyway, I don't remember which one I used. See, this is what happens, right? Then yeah. their things work out differently. Ugh, I hate this. Yeah. I wrote down the differences for them somewhere, but it was like one of them doesn't let you run chains in parallel. Uh, one of them does some other thing. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but you're right. That's a good thing to have, like a, like a little... Um, uh, like a chart or something like a like a uh, like a spreadsheet or something where you where you have that information. That's actually a very good idea. Ugh, I yeah, wrote it I down it. somewhere, but now I don't know where I wrote it down. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> oh, so much to learn, right? Anyway, yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that's um, I don't like that this book uses stamp. That's the one thing I don't yeah. like. <laughs> but. Um, but like I said, it's always good to know a little bit of how Stan works, how JAX works, so that you sort of understand the differences, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, but it's just so much, so much, so much, so much to learn. Yeah. Anyway, do we, should we attempt to see the exercises or, or were they to, did you take a look at the exercises or are they to just horrendous? Uh, well, I looked at them, but my brain wanted a break after reading, and then I yeah. get back to them. This chapter is a lot. Yeah. Okay, let's take a look at just, just because we have 10 minutes. So if we go to the exercises in, and we look at 6.2, trace plot diagnostics. For each MCMC simulation scenario described below, sketch by hand what a single chain trace plot might look like for each simulation. Okay, I think maybe we can attempt to do this one. The chain has no problems. It's going to look like a caterpillar, like the ones mm -hmm. you put. So that one is easy. The chain has a tendency to get stuck. I think that's the one you show where it was like a caterpillar at first and then a straight line. Caterpillar, I think, if a chain is mixing too slowly. Would that be the one that's like, yeah. <laughs> that, those are the two that I don't know. If, if it has high correlation, okay, let me check my notes. If it has, um, where are my notes here? That one might look like if it has high correlation. That maybe that one looks like. Yeah, the trend. Yeah, kind of like that. Like it could go, um, but maybe not not that. Um, maybe maybe more spread out. Like it goes up and then it goes down. 
but kind of but yeah you had the idea there so maybe you can draw it again yeah yeah and then it goes exactly yeah but but that's two two together like leave spaces <laughs> in between because that's good if, if it's a lot together yeah and then that yeah something like that yeah something like that and even stays down a little bit but that i think that that's um so that's going to be high correlation. Mixing too slowly. I don't know how that would be. Oh, maybe mixing too slowly would be going in a straight line and then jumping. Straight line, jumping down. Kind of like, like, like if those were steps. Maybe that's the mixing too slowly because I can't, I can't draw. Huh. Yeah, like mixing too slowly was the like spread out one like this like like in steps i thought but um yeah and then i think the stuck one was the one that was like that and then it would go like this yeah to me that's it gets stuck in a value <laughs> and then it's trying to move out but then it goes back to that one again the mixing too slowly ugh, i can't draw um oh can i draw annotate yeah, I think I can draw. <gasps> yeah, mm -hmm. I did that one, right? Okay, let yeah. me change colors. Okay, so to me, mixing slowly would be like this. And then it goes up. And then it goes down. Like in steps. That's is That to me is mixing slowly. So that's A. Yeah. yeah and then the other one, it was like this. This one is high out of correlation. It's going through all this, all the space, but high high out of correlation. And even if there are two, three, or four uh, chains, they're all sort of going like that instead of going all together like that, like a caterpillar. Okay. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> clear. Can I clear? Yeah. Okay. Let's see the other one. For each MCMC simulation scenario described below, describe how the scenario could impact the posterior approximation. Ah, ha. I think if it's mixing too slowly, you're not gonna get a good approximation because you're like trying to get this distribution, but your chain is like way over there. Its estimates are way off, but it's not getting to the right estimates. So you're going to get a very wide, or you're going to get, I think with all of them, you, you're you going to get wide, um, oh, what's that sound? You'll get wide, um, what do you call them? Um, confidence yeah. intervals, right? Yeah, and a very wide distribution. Instead of being thin, you'd get like, or you could even have exactly something like that, right? Or something else that I've gotten is that you can get sometimes something like this. Oh. So you don't really know if your parameter is going to be here or here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that's something that you can get. Okay. Yeah, and they mentioned that in the book also. Let's see. You, the <laughs> other one, your friend missed class this week and they're allergic to reading textbooks, a common affliction. Since you're a true friend, you decide to help them out with an answer, to help them out and answer the following questions. Why is it important to look at MCMC diagnostics? Why are MCMC simulations helpful? What are the benefits of using our stand? Need none. <laughs> we like Jags here. Yeah. What don't you understand about the chapter? Okay. The MCMC simulations, you answered those because you said it's computationally powerful. There are no benefits to using Stan. No, I'm <laughs> it uses that Hamiltonian powerful algorithm. So, but it doesn't have. Uh, it's not good with 
all types of models. I heard that it's not good with count when you have when your um y is count values like what we have with occupancy models or something like that. That's not really good. So it's better to use JAGs. Um, why is it important to look at MCNC diagnostics to see if there's autocorrelation in your values to see if you achieved good mixing and convergence, right? Yeah. Anything else you want to add? Not really. Thank you. Kelly, <laughs> <the faces. laughs> um, okay. I think we can stop here. This was a good discussion, Diana. I love it. When we can um when we can have a discussion and it's not just someone talking. Sometimes, not sometimes, all the time. I get so excited about these things and you're and I'm gonna be making comments throughout. I'm sorry. If you find it too That's annoying, okay. tell me and then I'll stop for the next time you present. I'll be muted so that you can't hear my observations. I'm just I I'm telling you, I get so excited about these things that I I can't, I can't help myself. I know, my guess. Yeah, like, oh, am I covering everything I'm supposed to be covering? So it's like good to know if other people have like got other important things out of the reading that maybe I didn't. Yeah, that too, right? Right? That's why I'm, I'll, yeah, that's why, I don't know. And I like it when it's interactive. Yeah, and that's part of the reason for doing a book club. <laughs> right oh, okay so next week um let's just check real quick who's presenting i signed up for the next three. Oh, are you presenting next week fantastic so you will talk about mcmc under the hood and then oh but your inference and prediction yes all right diana thank you so much um, this has been a lot of fun as always. Um, Oluwa Femi, do you have any questions, comments, or something you want to add? Sorry, I don't have any questions. I want to also apologize for jumping in late because okay. I finish. Okay. No, you're good. You're good. Um, so, okay, so let's continue with our discussion next week and uh, have a lovely Thanksgiving, Diana, and have a good night, Oloa Femi. See you next week, you guys. Okay, see you next week. Bye.